then we come to the cardiomyopathy the dilated cardiomyopathy uh, can be uh, acquired genetic and also mixed cardiomyopathy causes so these are the classification of cardiomyopathy so cardiomyopathy can be genetic mixed or acquired so genetic cardiomyopathy can be hypertrophic cardiomyopathy arcvd arrhythmogenic dysplasia left ventricular non compaction glycogen storage diseases some conduction differences and some disorders also they have come under cardiomyopathy long qt syndrome brugada short qt syndrome catecholaminergic polymorphic ventricular tachycardia and sudden death syndrome in asians acquired cardiomyopathies are uh, viral cardiomyopathies takutoshibo cardiomyopathies peripartum cardiomyopathy tachycardia induced cardiomyopathy and children of infant mothers dilated cardiomyopathy and restricted cardiomyopathy may have the mixed pattern so hypertrophic cardiomyopathy will have the small cavity and thick walls and the cardiomyopathy can be divided into a large heart a thin wall is dilated cardiomyopathy small cavity thick wall is hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and the small heart a small cavity dimension with thick walls is restricted cardiomyopathy so normal wall and normal ventricular dimension is normal ventricular dimension is increased the walls are thin dilated opposite hypertrophic walls are thick cavity is small cavity is small walls are thin walls are normal is restricted cardiomyopathy so this is about restricted cardiomyopathy so restricted cardiomyopathy predominantly will have diastolic dysfunction of grade 3 and 4 because in restricted cardiomyopathy what happens is because of the fibrosed muscle and endocardium here there is a enormous resistance to the left atrial emptying because of that there is a very high la pressure which has to overcome the resistance at the endocardial and muscular level to empty itself so there is enormous increase in la pressure whenever there is enormous increase in la pressure the diastolic dysfunction will go to 3 or 4 that's why it will be third 3 or 4 in a restricted cardiomyopathy so in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy it's grade 1 because it is a ventricle is hypertrophied and because it is not able to dilate so it is a relaxation abnormality in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy it's a restricted cardiomyopathy it's a relaxation abnormality in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy whereas in restricted cardiomyopathy because of the large la pressure you can have the grade 3 or 4 diastolic dysfunction where you have early diastolic filling exaggerated and rapid deceleration slope so this is how we understand the diastolic dysfunctions in restriction and also uh, the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy in dilated cardiomyopathy the patient can have any of these things but the dilated cardiomyopathy if the patient has got grade 3 or 4 dysfunction his prognosis is bad so that's what the dilated cardiomyopathy can be in any of this dysfunctional status it may be normal also it can be grade 1 also it can be grade 3 also grade 4 also but it decides a prognosis so if a dilated cardiomyopathy patient is in grade 3 or 4 when for the same adjacent fraction his prognosis is bad which are the following pulse indicates lv dysfunction we already seen that it is a pulses alternance so the pulses alternance is alternating weak and strong pulses to be seen in radial to be seen in standing position confirmed by blood pressure recording by uh, reducing the slowly the blood pressure to hear the corco sounds both in weak and strong pulses so the mechanism of pulses alternance we already discussed it is because of the change in the ventricular cardiality for alternate beats the monocardial fibers recruited for each beat is going to be different so that's why alternating beats clinical signs of lv dysfunction include all excepts the good heart sounds please remember one of the important clinical signs of lv dysfunction is muffled heart sounds the muffled heart sounds are primarily because many of your heart uh, valves closure are produced by the myocardial contraction so if the myocardial contraction is poor definitely you will not have good heart sounds so the third heart sound is a sign of dysfunction dyskinetic area and most important sign of uh, uh, heart failure is sinus tachycardia because in heart failure stroke volume is decreasing so to compensate for the cardiac output heart rate is increase which dilated cardiomyopathy has got a good prognosis the good prognosis is the peripartum cardiomyopathy 50% of peripartum cardiomyopathy is diagnosed whenever the patient develops signs of lv dysfunction or heart failure in the absence of any other etiology in the last month of pregnancy or 5 months postpartum so when the patient this is a dilated cardiomyopathy and 50% of patients with prepartum cardiomyopathy will regain lv function within few years 
the worst cardiomyopathy is HIV cardiomyopathy. Worst cardiomyopathy is HIV cardiomyopathy, where the prognosis is very bad. So, prognosis is good in peripartum and very bad in HIV induced cardiomyopathy. So, here you can see that here in a peripartum cardiomyopathy, your prognosis is good. In HIV induced cardiomyopathy, your prognosis is bad, whereas all the other cardiomyopathies are in between. Indication for endocardial myopathy in includes all except. Sometimes to find out what is causing the heart failure, if you are not able to diagnose by non-invasive means, you have to do endomyocardial biopsy. Going into the heart and take the biopsy of the heart and uh, make sure what is happening for the muscles and endocardium. So, the options are to detect rejection after heart transplant, to diagnose restrictive cardiomyopathy, to diagnose hypertrophic cardiomyopathy or monitoring myocarditis. So, what is the wrong answer here? The wrong answer is to diagnose hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, we need not do endomyocardial fibrosis bi bi biopsy. So, the endomyocardial biopsy indications are this. So, there are a lot of indications that any new onset of heart failure when you are suspecting whether it is due to myocarditis or dilated cardiomyopathy, dilated heart or viral myocarditis, you can do endomyocardial fibrosis and the chemotherapy induced myocardial, myocardial dysfunction and also unexplained restrictive cardiomyopathy, it is an indication to endocardial myocardial. When you suspect a cardiac tumor, it is an indication to do cardiomyopathy. And you think that uh, uh, dilated cardiomyopathy, when you have a eosinophilic associated dilated cardiomyopathy, you can do a cardiac endomyocardial fibrosis. And uh, these are the, some of the indications uh, to do, especially the important indication is restrictive cardiomyopathy and to detect heart uh, rejection after heart transplant is also very important indication to uh, do endomyocardial uh, biopsy. How many types of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy are there? So, we have four types. We will tell you about the four types. These are the four types of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is a left lung hypertrophy without any known cause. Cardiomyopathy by definition is a disease of the muscle with no cause. So, this can be a, a localized asymmetrical septal hypertrophy which is called sigmoid septum. So, localized basal septal hypertrophy, it is a yeah, 10% of uh, myocardial filament is involved here. So, genetic uh, predisposition is there here. 40 to 50% of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is a localized portion of septum is hypertrophy. The entire portion of the septum is hypertrophied. It is a reverse curve, reverse curve cardiomyopathy, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So, here more myocardial filaments are involved and it is the 30 to 40 percent of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And some patients will have hypertrophy only we have discussed about this when we looked at the ECG segment. So, when the patient has got a tall QRS with a deep symmetrical T wave inversion with a very sharp apex, the hypertrophy is localized to the apex and we will not have a left ventricular outflow gradient, you may have a mid ventricular gradient and this apical cardiomyopathy is typical in Japan. So, it is also called Yamakuchi disease and it is around 10 percent of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Sometimes you can have diffuse hypertrophy of the left ventricle. Diffuse hypertrophy of the left ventricle, all segments of the ventricles, uh, left ventricle is hypertrophied but no cause. There is no hypertension, there is no aortic stenosis, there is no subiotic membrane, there is no supraoral aortic stenosis, there is no coactation. So, nothing is there. But with no reason, diffuse hypertrophy of the ventricle is also indicate hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, which is also once again uh, around 10 percent. These two types are common. Localized septal hypertrophy or diffuse septal hypertrophy, otherwise called ASH, asymmetrical septal hypertrophy are the common types of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. The main pathogenesis in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is called myocardial fiber disarray. So, it is a genetically predisposed problem of the actin and myosin filaments, especially the myosin filaments, which produces myocardial fiber disarray. Two, sometimes they can show you a slide and ask you what is the pathology here. So, this is a normal uh, cardiac muscle syncytium. So, you can see how they are branching and there is no single cell. They are all branching and communicating with each other. So, this is a normal musculature. So, it is a normal musculature of the normal cardiac muscle. Here, you can see the myocardial fiber disarray. You can see the myocardial fibers are all disarrayed. They become uh, zigzag and they do not go a single format as a syncytium and so on. So, this is a classical myocardial fiber disarray. 
So the complication of this hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is fibrosis. So ultimately the myocardium gets fibrosis. So this is a, a, one of the advanced complications of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is fibrosis here. And you can see that mural thickening, a severe significant mural thickening which is happening due to hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So you can look at these two important uh, pictures there. So this is a myocardial fiber disarray and this is interstitial fibrosis and this is the stage from which the patient can migrate to this. At this stage, the patient may go for a sudden cardiac death, progressive uh, dilated card, uh, cardiomyopathy like picture and so on. The hallmark of uh, obstructive cardiomyopathy is systolic anterior movement of the mitral valve. It is not as if, as you can see in the previous slides, it is not as if the thickening of the septum is going to produce subbiotic obstruction. So it is not the thickening of the septum which is narrowing the left lateral flow tract is producing obstruction. What happens is this thickened septum when it contracts, when because of the thickened septum is there, it narrows the left lateral flow tract. So at the onset of systole, the early systolic flow through this narrow orifice is quick because the ventricle is contracting, it is quick. As the flow is going through the narrow orifice, it creates a lot of eddies. It produces what is known as eddies or the suction currents. So because of this flow produce, going through the narrow area is producing suction, it draws the anterior mitral leaflet towards the septum. This is called systolic anterior movement and that is producing the obstruction to middle or late systolic blood flow from the cavity into the left lateral flow tract and into the iota. So that is why the important pathology which causes the obstruction is not the thickened septum but the systolic anterior movement of the mitral valve. So naturally you can see that here, the, the, this is the uh, trans esophageal picture and this is your left atrium and this is your left ventricle, this is your aortic valve and this is the left ventricle outflow tract and this is the thickened septum. You can see how nicely you can see this anterior mitral leaflet. You can see initial systole is quick, how beautifully this anterior mitral leaflet is drawn towards the septum now. So because the anterior mitral leaflet is coming towards the septum, it is going to give an obstruction to middle to late uh, flow from the left ventricle into the left ventricle outflow tract. And this is a cardiac MRI demonstrating the left ventricle outflow obstruction. So please remember, whenever the left ventricle obstruction is there, because the systolic anterior movement, because the movement of the anterior mitral leaflet is coming into the septum, naturally there is no cooptation between the anterior mitral leaflet and posterior mitral leaflet. It automatically results in regurgitation. So obstruction is always associated with the mitral regurgitation. And this mitral regurgitation will go towards the left atrial posterior wall. So what happens hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is uh, why the obstruction is produced is one because of the abnormal structure. The abnormal structure is the bulging septum, caudal anomaly, small LV and papillary muscle displacement. That is a structural abnormality. Then you have a kinetic factors. So you have a geometric factors now. Geometric factors are the anterior displacement of mitral valve and also the reduced mid uh, mitral aortic angle is reduced. So all these geometric factors ultimately they lead on to kinetic factors. The kinetic factors are the hyperdynamic LV which will draw your anterior mitral leaflet towards the uh, into the left ventricle outflow tract and produce the obstruction. So systolic murmur of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy on standing we already explained many times dynamic auscultation. So any, any maneuver which is going to decrease your preload, when you any maneuver which is going to decrease your preload, we come to here, any maneuver which is going to decrease your preload will make the cavity small. Whenever the cavity is small, the distance between the anterior mitral leaflet and the septum is become very small. So easily the systolic anterior movement will come and touch the septum to produce left ventricular outflow obstruction significantly. So that's why in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, any maneuver like standing or valsalva, which will decrease our isometric hand grip, which will decrease the left ventricular cavity size, will increase the obstruction. When it increases obstruction, the murmur will automatically will increase. So murmur will automatically will increase. So that's the dynamic auscultation in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Whereas in aortic stenosis, because the preload is less, the stroke volume is less, so the amount of blood going through the obstructed wall is less, you have decrease in intensity of murmur in a fixed aortic stenosis. So that is an important difference between systolic murmur of HCM and aortic stenosis.
which clinical findings differentiate from valvular aortic stenosis from hypertrophic cardiomyopathy? Clinical findings. Peak of systolic murmur, ejection click, dynamic change in murmur, or LVH? The answer is, the question is except. That is, one is the wrong answer. The wrong answer, the one, one which cannot differentiate between hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and association is LVH. Whereas, these are the three things. The, the systolic murmur is in late systole in HOCM and in middle systole in aortic stenosis. Ejection click is present in aortic stenosis and absent in HCM. On standing, the murmur decreases in aortic stenosis, the murmur increases in HCM. So, all the three things will differentiate, but both aortic stenosis and HCM will have LVH. So, this is a diagrammatic representation of how hypertrophic cardiomyopathy murmur and aortic stenotic murmur is going to uh, behave during your valsalva and also the maneuver which will increase your venous return. For example, if you have a hypertrophic cardiomyopathy murmur, and if you do a valsalva and you are reducing cavity size, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy murmur will increase, whereas because you are decreasing the stroke volume, aortic stenotic murmur will decrease. Whereas when you increase your preload by squatting or lying, the cavity size is becoming larger, so the obstruction become less because it is a larger ventricle. It takes a long time for the systolic anterior movement of the mitral wall to happen, so obstruction becomes less. During the squatting or lying, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy murmur will come in less in intensity, whereas you are huge, well now we have a huge preload is there, huge stroke volume is going through the aortic valve, the aortic stenotic murmur will increase. So, this is how the murmurs will change during the dynamic process. The prognosis in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is primarily influenced by all except it is LVOT obstruction, mitral regurgitation, hypertrophy score or arrhythmias. So, the most important thing here, the wrong answer is mitral regurgitation. Mitral regurgitation is a part and parcel of LVOT obstruction. So, it is not going to decide about the prognosis. The main thing which will decide the prognosis is the amount of hypertrophy. So, even without obstruction, if our hypertrophy is more in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, the prognosis is bad. So, that is why if the hypertrophy is main, then of course, arrhythmias like sudden cardiac death. So, these are the established risk factors and newer risk modifiers. So, established risk factors are patient already had one episode of syncope or aborted sudden death and the uh, maximal thickness is more than 30 millimeter. Wall thickness is more than 30 millimeter. Family of sudden death, patient already on syncope, Holter shows non-sustained ventricle tachycardia and you have the abnormal blood pressure response to exercise. So, all these things are already established risk factors for sudden cardiac death in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Today, because of advancing investigations, we have newer parameters. We do always MRI for all hypertrophic cardiomyopathy patients. Late gadolinium enhancement will tell you about the fibrosis. Gadolinium is going to be taken up by the scar. So, the more scar is there in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, more fibrosis, the prognosis is bad. Marked LVOT obstruction to the tune of more than 50 millimeters of mercury across LVOT is a bad sign. So, mutations are multiple or the patient has apical aneurysm or a mid-ventricle obstruction, severe impairment of uh, diastolic and systolic function. So, atrial fibrillation, associated coronary artery disease are all the newer things which actually restatify the patient. So, what is very important in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is to look at whether this patient is going to go for a sudden death and how should I prevent sudden death in this patient and that is a very important factor. Even though the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy patient may not have an obstruction, it is very important to see the risk factors for sudden death and prevent it. All of the following drugs are contraindicated except. So, here what we can try to say is you should never give a vasodilator in a patient or a diuretic in a patient with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy because the vasodilators and diuretics and nitrate are going to decrease your preload and afterload and going to decrease your cavity size. The one drug which is indicated is disoperimate phosphate. Because of its negative coronatrophic properties, it will decrease the myocardial contraction and thereby decrease your obstruction. So, the one drug is not contraindicated here is disoperimate phosphate. So, drugs to be avoided in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy will be AC inhibitor, ARB and sartans and calcium channel blockers, alpha blockers, sildenafil 
all drugs which will increase the contraction like digoxin is contraindicated all drugs which will increase a, a contraction like pseudoephedrine and all these things are contraindicated in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy so now we come to the gene mutation which gene mutation is common in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy the cardiomyopathy can be happening because of the many mutation in the troponin or tintin or cardiac myosin heavy chain beta or cardiac actin so many mutations can produce uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy but the commonest gene mutation is cardiac myosin heavy chain beta so this is the important gene mutation which is very common in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy so here we are looking at the genes abnormality in the production of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy as you can imagine up 50 percent of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is going to be because of the cardiac myosin heavy chain beta mutation second come myosin binding protein c then comes cardiac troponin t and then coponin i so all the other things are much less in common so cardiac myosin heavy cardiac myosin heavy chain beta a mutation myh7 is the most common gene mutation to produce hypertrophic cardiomyopathy which gene mutation is benign hypertrophic cardiomyopathy because gene mutation itself will tell you whether it is myosin light chain, myosin heavy chain, cardiac troponin T or myosin binding protein C. So the benign is myosin binding protein C. As you can see that when you have the commonest beta cardiac myosin uh, heavy chain mutation, the patient will have severe hypertrophy, variable risk of sudden death according to mutation. Troponin, low penetrance, mild hypertrophy and may have a sudden death. But look at myosin binding protein C. It is going to have incomplete penetration and mild hypertrophy and benign evaluation. So when you have myosin binding protein C mutation, patient may have good prognosis. Whereas yes, uh, uh, having going to have the cardiac T troponin mutation, cardiac T troponin um, mutation, there is early sudden death is very common. So that's why you have to gene mutation and the prognosis also may be seen according to which gene mutation is there and which gene mutation is dangerous. So now whenever you think the patient with a hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, the patient is going to have a high risk and is got a high risk of uh, sudden death, you have to give ICD and the ICD indication for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy include all except the severe obstruction. So ICD is not given to relieve the obstruction. ICD is given to prevent sudden cardiac death. The markers of current object we already told you non-sustained ventricular tachycardia, maximal wall thickness at any point of your myocardial left myocardium more than 30 millimeter, huge late gadolinium enhancement is indicating of more fibrosis and more areas of re-entry. So all these things are indicated for ICD. So this is the approach to a main management guidelines of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So patient is benign and stable and you have to personalize the profiles of prognosis in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, personalized prognosis. So, most important thing is sudden death prevention. We have told you risk factors equal or more than one risk factor give ICD primarily, even before one syncope give ICD. Then we have progressive heart failure and obstruction. So, here the myosin inhibitors are coming into place now. So, so it is a surgical myectomy or alcohol septal ablation if the obstruction is going to be progressive and severe and newer drugs are coming in now, myosin inhibitors. Then progressive heart failure, non obstructive cardiomyopathy is going for progressive dilatation and dilated like uh, picture, then it all depends upon preserved heart failure or reduced heart failure. If the symptoms are progressing, it is only heart transplant. If the patient develops atrial fibrillation, anticoagulation is must for stroke prevention and either it is a rhythm control with amidrone and sotalol or dofetilide or an ablation. So, atrial fibrillation is poorly tolerated in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy because as you know hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is going to have grade 1 diastolic dysfunction where majority of filling is going to happen during atrial contraction because in early diastole the ventricle may not relax to receive the blood. So if the atrial fibrillation if the atrial contraction is not there the primary filling of the heart is going to be impaired the patient can deteriorate hemodynamically. So atrial fibrillation have to be has to be prevented in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and also if it happens, you must treat them vigorously to rhythm control. There is no role for rate control for atrial fibrillation in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. It is always 
convert that into sinus rhythm either by drugs or by catheter ablation or by mass procedure during open heart surgery. The latest drugs in HCM to reduce obstruction I told you which is called myosin inhibitor. The myosin inhibitor is the one which is going to decrease your contraction. If it is going to decrease your contraction, there is less chance of the antimatic leaflet to be drawn towards the septum and is called mevacamptan. Mevacamptan is the myosin inhibitor. So, myosin inhibitor is the one which is going to produce a decrease in SAM and decrease your obstruction. So, mevacamptan obstruction, the, how does the mevacamptan is going to act is, mevacamptan is a myosin inhibitor. So, you can see the thick filament is myosin and you have the myosin cross bridges there. When the cross bridges are normal, there is normal actin myosin sliding and normal contraction. This is a normal sarcomere. But problem in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is hypercontractility and impaired relaxation because of excessive cross bridges. Because of excessive cross bridges, because of that you have excessive contraction and the relaxation is also abnormal because of excessive cross bridges there. What the mavacamptum is going to do is to actually alternate, it is going to reduce this cross bridges and blocks this cross bridges, myosin filament cross bridges and thereby attenuate hypercontractility. When it is comprivate hypercontractility and produce increased compliance, then increase energetics, then definitely you have better symptomatic relief and reduce obstruction. So, it is a targeted inhibitor of cardiac myosin that it is number of myosin acting cross bridges. So, these are the cross bridges and it is going to significantly reduce that cross bridges here. So, this is the new drug for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Mava Campton. The restrictive cardiomyopathy pick the right uh, combination. The right combination here is small atria and large ventricles. Small area and small atria. So, whenever you see a picture like this, it is likely to be restrictive cardiomyopathy. When you have a very huge atrium, disproportionately elevated, uh, right, disproportionately enlarged right atrium and left atrium with a very small ventricles in the presence of a normally, work, normally opening atrioventricular valves. So, this is a classical echo picture of restrictive cardiomyopathy. So, here because of the endomyocardial fibrosis and thickening, the, there is a very stiff uh, ventricles. Because of the very stiff ventricles, the atria have to generate a very large amount of pressure to push the blood into this stiff ventricle. That is why there is enormous dilatation of the atrium when compared to the ventricles. So, that is the pathology and echo picture of restrictive cardiomyopathy. So, RCM is to be differentiated from constrictive pericarditis. The one important uh, differentiating uh, diagnosis, differential diagnosis for RCM is constrictive pericarditis because almost they present as severe systemic venous congestion. Because of the high RA pressure which is transmitted to the veins, the patient will have edema, enlarged JVP, ascites, enlarged liver. In constrictive pericarditis, because the right atrium is not able to, right atrium, right ventricle is not able to dilate to receive the blood from the vena cava, the blood accumulates the vena cava to produce systemic venous congestion. So, that is why it has to be differentiated from RCM. So, what are the parameters? Once again, I am asking for the wrong answer. So, whether it is a respiratory variation Doppler, whether endomyocardial biopsy will help, whether ejection fraction will help or tissue Doppler will help. Here, the wrong answer is ejection fraction. So, because the ejection fraction is going to be normal, both in restrictive cardiomyopathy and constrictive pericarditis. So, subsequently we are going to see uh, many answers and many uh, questions about this uh, variation between restrictive cardiomyopathy and card constrictive pericarditis. We will tell you the importance of each one of them in subsequent uh, pictures. And these are the differentiating points between constrictive pericarditis and restrictive cardiomyopathy. I told you restrictive cardiomyopathy also can have the important sign is Kussmaul sign where the JVP increases on inspiration and the um, uh, pericardial knock may be present in uh, constrictive pericarditis and here the one normal wall thickness and the very very important Doppler parameter is that the ventricular interdependence. Because of the ventricular interdependence, there is a gross decrease in mitral flow in inspiration and there is a gross decrease in tricuspid flow in expiration. So, this respiratory variation is very typical of constrictive pericarditis. This respiratory variation may not happen restriction. So, because the restrictive cardiomyopathy is a problem of the muscle, 
your e prime is significantly decreased in cardiomyopathy the e prime or the tissue doppler parameters is normal in constrictive pericarditis then of course thick pericardium in constrictive pericarditis normal pericardium in restricted cardiomyopathy and of course there is lot of uh, cath finding one of the important cath finding i want to highlight is that pulmonary hypertension is more common in patients with restricted cardiomyopathy when compared to patients with a rest constrictive pericarditis so that is a important uh, and another important difference between constriction and restriction common arrhythmia and restricted cardiomyopathy is atrial fibrillation many patients uh, we have picked up restricted cardiomyopathy retrogradely by looking at the af patient with come with uh, unexplained af uh, when you do an echo uh, serially the patient ultimately land up with restricted cardiomyopathy this is because of the enlarged atrium and the enlarged atrium produces fibrosis and also produce lot of arrhythmias uh, important being the atrial fibrillation so now the echo picture is suggestive of what rcm so there are lot of etiology for restricted cardiomyopathy it can be low flux uh, uh, endocarditis it is a burnt out of endomyocardial fibrosis it can be a sarcoid it can be an amyloid so it can be radiation so all these things will produce restricted cardiomyopathy now we have shown a picture like this echo picture like this and asking what type of restricted once again it's a restricted cardiomyopathy see the large atria small ventricles but the here is you can see the ventricles are hypertrophied you can see some different echogenic features in this uh, uh, cardiac muscle here so this type of lvh like picture with the restricted cardiomyopathy is most often due to amyloid cardiac amyloidosis due to trans erythritin abnormality trans erythritin amyloidosis compared to chain amyloidosis it is a trans erythritin amyloidosis will produce hypertrophy like picture it looks like a hypertrophic cardiomyopathy but in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy your lvh will be associated with the enlargement of left atrium only not the right atrium so here both right atrium left atrium is enlarged and the there are lot of paradoxes in cardiac amyloidosis we'll come to that little later so when you have this restricted cardiomyopathy with thickened walls and especially with a typical echogenic pattern like this you must think of amyloidosis and the most interesting point in cardiac amyloidosis is in speckle tract so this is the latest echo technology where we see in like a tissue doppler where you see the tissue movement we see the tissue doppler disadvantages the doppler movement of the septum has to be septum or the ventricular wall has to be parallel to the transducer to pick up the right velocity of the moving muscle whereas in speckle tracking or the automatic functional image automated functional imaging like this what we do is to see how the speckles are moving up and down in contraction and relaxation and each portion of the myocardium is seen and it is given as 17 segment model and we see each segment is how it is moving and it, they can give an objective score so normally the negative more than minus 14 is normal so when the myocardium is moving in opposite direction it will become blue myocardium is less moving it will become less red and the myocardium is normally moving it will go beyond minus 14 what is very typical of amyloid cardiomyopathy is the apical sparing so you will not have a significant speckle tracking abnormality in the apex whereas all the portion of the myocardium will be involved in amyloidosis contrast to this you can always think it can be apical cardiomyopathy in apical cardiomyopathy also the picture may be like this whereas in apical hypertrophic cardiomyopathy typically the apex portion of the left ventricle will be fibrous so you will see the blue color in the apex there is apical involvement in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and apical sparing in amyloid cardiomyopathy so this is a very important uh, differentiating point between amyloid when you looking at hypertrophic cardiomyopathy like picture whether it is amyloid or hypertrophic cardiomyopathy can be easily picked up by the speckle track so what is restricted cardiomyopathy so restricted cardiomyopathy is the left atrium is very very angry because it is not allowed to empty into the ventricle because of the fibrosis recurrent thromb recurrent fibrosis and inflammation of the endocardium and myocardium with recurrent thrombus formation the cavity itself will become small and stiff so that is non stretching of the restricted heart so the myocardium is stiff and strict and say no to the blood from the left atrium so naturally ultimately the left atrial pressures are going to increase and when the myocardial the failure signs are going to be reflected into 
the respective venous systems to have the cardiac muscle. So left atrium is not able to pump and is producing black flow into the systemic veins and the pulmonary veins. Look at the etiology of restrictive cardiomyopathy. This is what I told you. Anything which will increase the fibrosis of cardiac muscles and also the endocardium. It is a fibrosis of the endocardium and the muscles. So the commonest cause I told you about the low flush syndrome and the burnt out lesion of low flush syndrome is endomyocardial fibrosis and endomyocardial fibrosis or congenital endomyocardial elastosis is a congenital condition. Uh, low flush syndrome to going into the burnt out lesion is endomyocardial fibrosis. Post radiation, we already seen about hemochromatosis and sarcoidosis and also the amyloidosis. So these are the causes of restrictive cardiomyopathy and this is a pathology of restrictive cardiomyopathy. So the most common arrhythmia in restrictive cardiomyopathy is atrial fibrillation. So many times these patients will come with atrial fibrillation. So the treatment of atrial fibrillation in restrictive cardiomyopathy is only rate control. You cannot achieve rhythm control and maintain it because you have an abnormal substrate atrium uh, which will produce atrial fibrillation. In hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, I told you it is a rhythm control. Whereas in restrictive cardiomyopathy, it is always a rate control along with oral anticoagulants to prevent stroke. Here you have to control the rate and also prevent stroke with oral anticoagulants. That is the mode of treatment. The rate control in drugs are digoxin, verapamil and also sometimes you can use a beta blocker.